So I'm curious about this from implicit to explicit. So it is part of about the way we show up every day and it is the stories we tell, but you both touched on things like, um, for example, images or even office design and how that reflects culture, right? Um, and we're learning a lot about how even just space can impact human relationships, right? Going from you know, cubicles or offices where everybody's in their own individual office to much more open space like we're seeing in Silicon Valley, right? Uh, I'm not sure how important bean bags and bringing dogs to work is to culture, but you know, that's an element uh, as well, it's right? It's culture you want. If it's culture you <laughs> want, right? And so um, <clears throat> give us a couple of examples, you know, or systems and policies. What are some examples of things you've done to be very explicit about how you kind of embed the culture in the organization and translate it into structures or policies or, or very deliberate ways of working? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most important things that we've done since um, we have put in a, you know, speaking of HR systems, put in a performance management system, part of that was not just what did you do, but how did you do it, right? right? So we can all have goals that are very specific and smart goals where they're measurable and time bound and all the things that we know that we want to do. But we've always had part of our performance ma management system also be about, you know, are you showing up and representing the values and the, the characteristics right. of how did you achieve those goals? And I think that's, you have, you know, and, and it actually has always been a, a, you know, kind of an explicit um, conversation about, you know, okay, great, you achieved that goal, but you actually didn't do it in a way, perhaps, that right. was supporting of the values of the organization. You actually so, trampled over 10 yeah, people to get there. To get there. And so <laughs> those are really important, yeah. healthy conversations. You have to train your managers on that process. You have to bring everybody, you know, to, to having those very <coughs> direct and open conversations. Um, so that's one way we've re reinforced. I think the other way, given the very cross-cultural, which is a whole other element of culture right. for Room to Read, the cross-cultural way that we operate, given that we raise money in 16 countries, we you know, provide direct services in 10 other countries, it's a very complex geographic footprint that you know spans a lot of different languages and cultures for Room to Read. Um, and so we actually have to have very clear conversations. I actually, we, we brought in a new um, head of our HR several years ago, and we actually went through a process where we talked about our kind of evolving culture. What were some of the old cultural habits and what were some of the new culture ways that we wanted things to evolve so that we were really explicit? And we needed to do that because it doesn't always translate. If we're all sitting here working in the Bay Area, that might be an easy conversation to have. But as we look at Room to Read, we found that to be a very hard conversation. So you know, we used to talk a lot about Room to Read in the early days about being cheap and cheerful. You know, everything had to be cheap and cheerful. We were a nonprofit, we were a startup. <laughs> you know, what did that really mean, right? Now we needed to evolve that. That actually sounds exhausting. It is, it was exhausting. It was actually very fun, fun, you know? Costco is great cheap food, you know, when you have a party. Um, you don't need a caterer, you know, whatever that shows up as, right? But now we talk about it as being cost effective. And so it's not just about doing it cheaply, it's about doing, you know, in, in doing the best work you can in a cost-effective manner, right? So the, you know, we, we have a term at Room to Read called GSD, get stuff done, which is a polite way of saying it. Um, given our culture, we don't actually use the, the polite way very often, but in polite <laughs> company, I will keep it as get stuff done. We involve that into GSDR, get stuff done right. Because it wasn't about just getting it quickly done anymore. Now that we're a much bigger organization and we had to have a lot more participation, <coughs> It was about getting it done right, you know, and that may take longer, but it right. was still, it still kind of keeps the same spirit alive. So we've had to be, you know, in order to translate this across everywhere we're working, we've had to have those conversations and go through the ways that we want to evolve and keep it, you know, something that is uh, very clear. Yeah, that's great. Benson, what about your organization? How have you made some of this explicit? Well, probably the biggest area is HR. You know, I mean, for most nonprofits, it's a people business. You know, for us, that's not different probably 80% of our budgets, people. And so, you know, I think it's figuring out how do you have HR policies that reflect who you want to be. Um, you know, it's, no, it's, it's not a um, secret that we have gender uh, disparities uh, throughout uh, our society, but it shows up in our sector as well. We have to look at leave policies. We have to look at uh, responsibilities t uh, that, uh, that people take on that are, are, are unequal. Um, so I think HR policies is the number one area. Um, I think that, um, you know, um, that's how you can, one way you can uh, look at it, um, but another way is to think about, again, the way we project externally, right? And so, again, so, so, so to me, like, the nonprofit sector has an, a special responsibility, right, to, um, to have the type of culture, to have the type of practices that we want to see uh, throughout society. Um, and for a lot of our work, you know, we uh, use sort of a pyramid model where at the top is like the campaign or the policy we're pushing. And it could be, say, affirmative action in technology companies, 
right? You know, where there's a, a huge foreseeable disparity for different communities of color and employment in a lot of technology companies. Uh, we know this. Um, you know, and those, um, you know, that, that, those, those policies and, and those campaigns to achieve those policies have to sit on top of issues, and those issues have to sit on top of values, right? But we always lead with the values. We always lead with the values and say, you know, do we value inclusion? Do we value diversity? And people generally will say yes, right? And it's like, okay, well then let's look and see how that plays out in contracting, in procurement, in employment, in promotion. And then from there, you know, going up to the next level, okay, recruiting practices. You know, what is the hiring practice, right? Uh, and then that actually sort of, you know, I think is another way of looking at it, sort of yeah. starting in the base <coughs> and keep pushing, pushing up. Um, Aaron, you touched on this a little bit, but there's, you know, given the unique context of both of your organizations, there's kind of another layer to this complex conversation around culture. And for you, it's this layer of working globally <coughs> in different countries and different languages, but also being a rapidly scaling organization. And when we were on the phone, you talked a little bit about what does it look like to manage culture dur during a period of extreme growth? I mean, you, you talked about some of those shifts you had to make from GSD to GSDR, um, but I'd love you to touch on that. And then for Vin, it's really around this, the culture of you are working in an ethnic community, Chinese yep. for affirmative action. So you have an organizational culture, but there's also a culture to the community in which you're working. That's right. Right? And so would love you to talk a little bit about that as well. So, Yeah, I, mean, I think the challenge um, the, across cultures that you find is you know, you want to honor and and be deeply rooted, at least in the in our field where education, you know, is and should remain um, a main responsibility, in my opinion, at the primary and secondary level of a government, mm -hmm. right? So we're working within a government system within a country that has a lot of core beliefs on how education should be delivered, and at the same time, we're trying to support and have you know, encourage them to do a better job at delivering quality education and bring in new international kind of best practices and know-how that can help improve them. Um, improve the delivery of education. So we're somewhat of a change agent within a very bureaucratic system, right? So it's a very hard thing to do because culture gets mixed in with all of this. And then how do we have an organizational culture of room to read within all these other contexts of external cultures, right. both, you know, the government, the, the country, you know, all of these things. So it's, it's, you know, it's like peeling an onion, you know, it's one of those examples where it's so, you think it's so easy and you think you've actually done something well and then you peel the layer off and you realize, oh wait, we totally did not get that right. And so it's, I don't think there's an easy way other than the, the one thing I have found is I think it's really important just to be um, open about those conversations. It's kind of the, the same, same thing I said around leadership, which is we have found a lot when we're, when we're all assuming things and not talking about it, you know, across cultures, that's when things usually tend to go wrong. We think that you understood what I said and I thought that you understood what I said, but we're clearly having a totally different conversation. And so sometimes it is just really important and we now you know, are obsessive about things like internally within our organization, we have a whole delegation of authority, right? Like what level can decisions be made at on what topics? Because I thought you understood when I said that you couldn't hire without you know, including somebody in that process and you thought I'm empowered to hire whoever I want, right? So now what do we do? Because we're going ahead with totally different assumptions. And so we have to delegate, we have to be really clear. Like when are you the total decision maker? When do you need to consult and bring people in? to some of these very process-driven types of <coughs> aspects of running an organization. And that has helped us a lot because then at least we are all hopefully, you know, 90% of the time on the same page and all working off the same playbook. I, I just want to comment on that before Vince responds, but I think clarity of decision rights and being clear on when it's a democratic consensus decision versus when one person owns the D versus when it's something in between, like we're going to have yeah. a conversation, but ultimately these three people are going to decide, that would help clear up so much miscommunication and conflict in the whole social sector if we could get clear on that. And I think the nonprofit sector, at least from my experience, has done that, you know, that has, has more of those policies. I think because, again, we're so mission driven and, and a lot of it is passion that drives nonprofits. And I think because we're so under resourced right. um, in our ability to invest in our own organization, sometimes that isn't the natural bent of, uh, you know, as a first place to start. But we have found to get to scale, um, it has helped us a lot because we're now actually saving ourselves a lot of time and a lot of miscommunication and a lot of bad feelings were because we're much more explicit. Right. And I assume, and I just want to check my assumption, um, do you hire local leadership in the countries you work in? So yeah, presumably that's, you, you also that's a good have point. We, Our country director policy. is like the CEO of that country and everyone from the country director all through our programming staff, which is 87% of our staff are in Asia and Africa. 
um, and they're all local nationals of their countries running very strong local organizations. Oftentimes people don't even know Room to Read is an international organization because you know, the local leader who is showing up is actually you know, a national of that country and they think it's actually a local nonprofit, so which really, I love. I mean, that's part of our culture. So that's gotta help with the local localization yes. and the embedding piece, but then the complexity of running a team that's right. so global is where is the, the challenges come in. Yeah, great, good. Ben, how about you in terms of working within the Chinese community in Chinatown right. and San Francisco? And, yeah. and and not just that, I mean, it's Chinese, but also larger Asian community right. in San Francisco. Right. Well, you know, um, like San Francisco has this reputation for being a, a very progressive place, uh, but it's not the water, <laughs> it's the work, right? And, you know, in order to keep it progressive and to keep expanding our understanding of what it means to be progressive, you got to do the work. Um, you know, around a third of the, the city population is of uh, Asian descent. Right? And a big part of our role is to help people understand, you know, what do we mean by being more inclusive? What do we mean by being more compassionate? And then how do those translate to policies? We had a campaign um, when I started at CAA to get a community college campus built in Chinatown. $150 million project. We had to get, um, over the years, uh, several bond measures passed, which required getting people registered to vote, uh, which required getting people to vote the right way after, you know, learning about the issues. Uh, and dealing with just a, a whole number of processes. Um, but community college is a great example. There's this myth that Asian Americans are all well off and don't have any problems. And, you know, there are more um, uh, Asian Americans who attend City College of San Francisco than attend the entire Ivy Leagues uh, schools, right? And so, you know, like our community does have a lot of needs, uh, a lot of immigrants, low income, limited English proficient. Um, but I think that it's not just about um, making sure their, um, uh, their issues are addressed, but to put it in the context of all communities, mm -hmm. which is why you know, we have a project called API Quality, which is to you know, try to lift up the visibility and give voice to Asian Americans who are also lesbian, bisexual, transgender, gay. We have work with uh, those who are um, incarcerated uh, or formerly incarcerated. Right? And so I think a lot of our work is just to, you know, uh, break away from our, um, you know, these these understandings that have been given to us about who we are, mm -hmm. right? And you know, and that applies to all of us. I mean, the more we can see the complexity of our identities, hopefully, we can be more uh, uh, humane in terms of how we bring everyone in, and actually fight for the policies that would allow us to do that. Great. So I want to open it up again to the audience. Um, let's take some questions on culture, but it can also be on leadership. We'll do about ten. 15 minutes of questions and comments from all of you. And then um, we'll close with a few final questions for our panelists. So, um, so anyone, we didn't have anyone from this side of the room. <laughs> you guys, I'm gonna challenge you all to be leaders here. So step up <laughs> with your questions. Um, I'm wondering how, Erin, you talked a little bit about during the hiring process of evaluating more for culture versus skills. So we've heard a lot about culture, and I'm wondering how do you do that in an hour-long interview? Or mm. like, if, other than just talking about the values, which it might be really easy for someone to say, "Yeah, I believe in X, Y, or Z." Right. How do you actually do that during the hiring process? Um, great question. So technically, one of the things that we do is departments don't, you know, just hire. Like, you don't just have the hiring manager and a couple of key people are going to interact. You actually have to have people from the broader organization. Um, be brought into the hiring process. So at least one or two other people outside of that immediate team be a part of that. Because usually they're not then able to ask the questions on technically what are you going to do as an IT specialist, right? I don't know anything about technology. So I'm going to interview you like, do I want you as my colleague? You know, do I think that, and so those questions, first of all, tend to be much broader and less technical and bring in that, you know, kind of, we, we actually have people who, in the interview panel who are kind of hiring for culture. That's their job is to feed back and echo back if they think that person would fit in. Um, and then specifically, like, you know, I actually do a lot of that myself. And, and I ask specifically questions that are, of course, you know, more, more broad in that. What do you, when you show up, you've worked in, you know, a number of places now in your career. When you show up to work, what do you look for as where you think you will thrive and, and what kind of core values? So it's more about you telling me rather than me telling you what my culture is. It's hearing you describe that. And it's also about saying, you know, when you've had to um, discipline somebody in, a, in your organization, how have you done that? You know, and asking tougher questions. There, have to walk you through because all those things are you know, very um, clear examples that they have to give of the way they ha you know they did something will 
often be much more about what they value, you know, then again, well, obviously, technically, I had to go in and tell them they were fired, right? But how did they do that? What was the process? How did they, you know, tell their team? You know, how did they make that decision? All those things are usually more about, you know, the values that they have. And so finding, you know, key questions where they have to describe their actions and their behaviors um, can tell, tell you a lot. By the time you get, if you're, you know, if you're getting sort of towards the close of it, you know, we actually have them, most, you know, most um, candidates at all levels in the organization end up, their final round, they'll end up spending, you know, nearly a day in our office. Um, and, you know, you see them walking around, you see them interacting with other people, they're often going out for a coffee um, with, you know, people, perhaps direct reports that we're reporting to them, they're going out for a lunch with somebody, you know, it's, it's sort of those informal moments where usually people show themselves more too. So we design the whole process <coughs> very much to give us the time to get to know somebody on a way that, you know, is a, a different way than just, you know, do you have the right skill match for this job? Great. Okay. Wow. So now you guys have risen to the challenge. I'm happy. Okay. So let's just take let's just take these three questions quickly, and then we can um, maybe tag team and respond to them. So let's just do three questions all at once. Yeah. Great. I'll pass the mic after. Okay. <clears throat> thanks. So earlier, uh, as a part of culture, we were talking about nonprofits investing in their own people, developing the leaders. What are some of the indicators that you're doing it right? Because I hear a lot of leaders talk about, oh, we invest in our staff and we're helping people come. What are some of the indications that it's actually working? Okay, great. So how do we know if what we're, <clears throat> what we're doing is working? Okay, and then you had your hand up here in the red, and then we'll pass it back to the woman right behind you. So thanks. I've learned the hard way that when, le when culture becomes a box that you check, defining your culture, that you're really in trouble. And so I'd love to hear more about mm -hmm. not checking the box of culture and having those buzz conversations as a leadership team but really defining culture in a way that's going to be pivotal and impactful to the organization and how you've had the most success trans transforming the culture as a result of those decisions and conversations. Great question. Yes. Okay. And so then the woman back here. Yes. My question is almost the reverse of the gentleman right in front of me is how do you identify when things are going wrong and then how do you create a strategy to systematically address, you know, pinpoint issues in the culture? Um, and sort of readdress those issues. So let me rephrase that. So if you put those two questions together, it's yeah. how do you know when it's either working or not working, right? Absolutely. And how do you respond as an organization? So, um, so let's start there. And then, uh, and if you guys also want to then touch on this, how do you make it not just a checking the box exercise? And you can just tackle it whatever yeah. order you want. Go ahead. I mean, I think I think a lot of what you guys are addressing gets does get to the practical side of things of what you're what you're asking for. And so I can give you examples, but it's you know it's, it's throughout the organization. I mean, a lot of it really is the policies and the systems that you put in place to reinforce um, what your hopefully you know are your values, right? And so we spend a lot of time where, for example, we have a management dashboard. Every country has one, and we roll it up to global one where we measure things very clearly: metrics on turnover, metrics on staff satisfaction. Service. Surveys. We do a large survey once a year and a checkpoint temperature read every you know, six months. Those are translated into the languages of the cultures that we're working in. So it's not like take this in English and I have no idea what the question is. It's you know what is it that is you know do you have the tools? Are you motivated to tell people about the work that you're doing and, and recruit people to the team? Do you feel that you're satisfied with your job? Do you have the right level of responsibility? Do you, you know, all of these things that we ask the teams to you know give us that. Um, anonymous feedback so that we can judge, you know, the, the morale, the, the satisfaction of our team. Um, we look at performance metrics, you know, in terms of something that we've worked very hard on is to build out a capacity s assessment tool where you can look at growth opportunities of how people are doing their current job and when will they be promotable. And on our dashboard, you know, for each office is what percentage of employees have gone through that process now and have a written, you know, individual development plan. Um, and so we're tracking, you know, it's what gets measured gets done, right? It's about having visibility. We've stated this as a goal. We measure against that goal until it's done. And then we check in regularly of whether that's, you know, kind of continuing to, um, you know, result in, the, in what we're hoping it will for the staff. Um, so we do really, we're obsessive about data. And, and I think data does unearth when things aren't going well, right? When you, when you can really look at that and you see turnover rising, you know, you see something, vacancies not being filled fast enough. Why, why is it? You, you know, maybe your reputation's not great in that market and you need to understand why is your reputation as an employer or not, you know, best in class. And so you have to, you know, that data will unearth other questions. So it sounds like I just want to underscore because uh, another thing we're going to kind of end on is around being a learning organization. But I think 
think what I hear you saying, just the importance of you're getting so much input and so much data all the time, but it's creating those feedback loops. So yes. you can identify what's working and right. what's not working immediately. And you can also do apples to apples across different countries and cultures. I think that's got to be enormously yes. helpful as a management tool. Yeah, and we have, you know, we have audits, we do HR, human resource audits, yeah. financial mm -hmm. audits, you know, so you're just, you have to go at it so many ways. I think that, you know, the other question sort of more on, um, also is about how do you ensure that it works and it's not just a value you know, on a wall. I do think that does come down to probably more about access and more informal ways of reinforcing it. So, you know, we'll do management coffees. We'll, you know, come in and talk to your, you know, your chief financial officer and just ask her all the questions you didn't, you know, want, you know, didn't ever want to ask in an all hand staff meeting, but you want to get to know that person better. Um, you know, are there ways that you can, we have what we call shout outs at the end of our staff meetings where people are shouting out and recognizing somebody, a team member, and they're kind of reinforcing the values about mm -hmm. collaboration. And, you know, we have awards when we do our country management conference, we actually give awards based on our stated values. So you showed up and you did this and worked this year and you did it really well. So we're going to, you know, give Bangladesh the award, you know, for you know the diversity or whatever it is. You know, we're actually reinforcing it through right. every informal way that we can. We try to celebrate and you know shine the light on you know, when it's working well and create those ways to celebrate that and provide that access and visibility to everybody of what we want. Terrific, good. Vince, what about in your organization? So we have fewer staff, so we just talk about it. I mean, I think <laughs> we don't have the systems That's, in place. Yeah. But we organize the conversation. So the, for us, those, you know, those four values about you know, being the change we want to be, are we learning from one another? Um, are we embracing risk? Are we engaging the community? And are we principled in our leadership? And we talk about it. And we talk about our, uh, you know, our folks in the organization. And uh, you know, how are they doing with that? Right? And maybe we have someone on the team who's still a little bit nervous about getting out there. And you know, or we have someone who's like, ah, so tough judgment call in terms of how they led there. So, so we talk about it. Yeah, say your four values again. So. Um, well, I should. I probably should say the ones that I care about more, which are the ones that we stand for. So we stand for inclusion, uh, compassion, and equity. Uh, and I should say that we're a very qualitative organization. So for each of these things, we have like a paragraph that, you know, and we can, you know, in the interviews, like, well, what does inclusion mean to you? So someone have to talk about it and maybe they'll tell a story about their experiences. I'm like, yeah, they really get the work. Um, but uh, the, the four in terms of being the change we want to be, um, you know, are we learning from one another? Are we embracing risk? Are we engaging the community? And are we practicing principled leadership? Okay, great, good. Okay, so let's take a couple of questions from uh, this side of the room. Yeah, so this, Back here, yes. Um, so I, I had a question just in relationship to um, organizations that are in change, which could be purposeful or imposed. Sometimes uh, you are, are working with a population where legislations have changed, other things change that kind of lead your organization yeah. in a direction of change that's required. Right. Um, and, and so I think that my experience has been is that in either of those situations, the leadership um, you know, is more likely to get on board with that, you know, if it's an in, imposed change or, you know, if they're making a decision as a leadership board or leadership management kind of team of where they, you know, their vision, and, and that may have included representation from line staff and supervisor level, that kind of thing. But, and I think, you know, kind of you talked about values then kind of going to policy, so do your policies actually reflect back to your values? And then the next piece is, does your practice actually have the intent of the policy which was tied to the values? And my experience has been when you're kind of experiencing um, large, you know, long periods of change, some people are much more willing and excited about change than others. And so how do you kind of bring staff who've been around for a long time and have tremendous value in what they bring to the table, but really struggle in that movement and value shift that an agency may be making either because of imposed change or purposeful change. Okay, great, good. So it's a question of change, yeah. how it relates to culture and, and congruence as well. Well, you know, when, when I started um, this conversation on my end, I, I talked about change, and I think that, you know, on the one hand, we have a lot of work that we need to do that's f fairly simple, sometimes complicated, and we have a wealth of resources around good practices, best practices. There are good practices and best practices for um, how to get your audit done, 
um, they're good practices, best practices for, you know, how to set up your accounting system. Um, the where we're going is that most of us are getting hit by change all over the place. And a lot of these good and best practices don't apply so well because like it's a whole new world. Um, you know, and so I think in this space, the um, aspiration is to be adaptive. It's to understand um, you know, how to be uh, in an emergent space um, and uh, to be attentive. Um, so essentially things happen that you can't predict. The best you can do is meet the very next day and figure out what do we do now. Right, and um, you know, and for different types of organizations, that will look differently. You know, I mean, I think about the way so many of um, our nonprofits took dramatic cuts during the economic recession, right? And it's like, okay, some of the best practice kind of went out the window, and like, you had the five-year plan, and it's like, okay, that's you know, putting that aside now. And so I think it's about, you know, uh, getting to a place where we're comfortable with being attentive and adaptive to you know being strategic essentially every day. Yeah, we've, I mean, we've gone through a lot of being a high growth, fast, you know, growing organization. We've gone through a lot of change. And so I think the two things I would say um, are, you know, the key with going through a change management kind of process is to try to get everyone as fast as possible through the uncomfortable parts of change, right? And, and that sounds easy to do. It's a lot harder to do. Um, the thing that I would say that is most important that I found is to find those champions who are going to lead the way. There's actually a great book on the back of, um, that I recommended called Tribal Leadership on the back of the handout that you have, our bios. And the whole theory is that really pretty much the only way to um, you know, create a kind of change and, and lead it is through by using these natural small groups in an organization um, and using them to spearhead the change. And mm -hmm. so you, you, and a group has it can only be three people in its smallest form. Two people kind of feels like a dictatorship oftentimes, right? Mm -hmm. You guys are just like a coots. <laughs> you both agreed on something and now you're trying to convince us. We as a threesome, it's a lot harder to do that. We kind of all keep each other more honest. And then you build on that. You, and, it's, and, and what the author of Tribal Leadership pretty much claims is between three and 12 people are that you know somewhere anything bigger than that's it's too big of a group um, and what you end up having to do is use those natural groups mm -hmm. whether they be like a leadership team or maybe they be a set of of you know it, maybe it's an informal group you know that's it's a group that are just you know these are kind of the people that all the people in the organization like to that think are the funniest and most lively types and so if they start talking about something they start to convince the rest of the staff but you have to start to use and build on these natural groupings that happen in organization if you can get them on your side then they start to lead the way for the change and then that starts to pull everyone through that you know those the uncomfortable part where people are like what does this mean for me why are we doing this what's the purpose and then you try to get them over to the other side to where the you know the nirvana is what why we all did, you know wanted to create this change and what our new goals are and if you can get them through that by those natural leaders and groups it works much better and I think that's for our world that's really important because it is oftentimes in different countries we're trying to find those natural leaders in those countries that can bring everyone together that still stays under the global room tree umbrella but we're using you know kind of small groups to do that yep okay so Rose you'd had your hand up let's take these these will be our two last questions then we're going to close with just a couple final comments from the panel yeah Thank you. Um, I have two little questions. You could pick one or the other. Um, one of them is, what um, tools, uh, a device, uh, an, um, a communication tool like an app or whatever, do you use or is there anything that you use that helps communication in a group? And the next question is, what do you think, what one or two tips might you give somebody that you believe works for the call to action when you're asking for money that okay. you have done. So let, and let's get this last question in here, and then um, you can talk about communication tools, the ask, sort of asking for money, and what is your question, ma'am? So uh, Vincent, I wanted to just mention that uh, you're one of the few leaders who talks about risk in the nonprofit, so I want to applaud you for that. Uh -huh. Somehow I find the nonprofit uh, sector to be so risk averse. Yeah. What is that whole thing about 
afraid. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. I do my training of thought is all business, but at the same time, I'm in the nonprofit world thinking, okay, why don't we take risks? No, 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 we can't fail. And I am just absolutely <laughs> baffled by the idea of being afraid to fail because if we are afraid to fail, how are we going to grow up? Right. Why is it acceptable for the small startup companies to fail with millions of dollars behind their back? And then the nonprofits with the $100,000, they're still afraid to do anything. So. I right. just want to say thank you. Yeah, and and we're and we're supposed to be the R and D lab for government, right? Yeah, so that's a, that's kind of the elephant in the room. The whole question about risk. Um, so let's just uh, take those really quick, and then I have two closing questions for you guys, and then we'll wrap. Well, I, I mean, maybe I can talk about the tool because that's a little bit easier. I think one tool that has <laughs> changed um, our the way we've worked is you know, this is going to sound like a plug. It's not meant to be, but Google Docs, um, just because. Multiple people can be working on the same document in real time, and that does change our ability to collaborate. Um, so I think that's that's one. Um, in terms of direct ask for fundraising, I, you know, there'd have to be more context. I think that it really depends, but there's no um, you know easy way. Um, I think that you know ideal situation. Um, by the time you're asking for the money you already know the response you're going to get, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's, you know. But then it goes to the question of risk, and, you know, I think that, um, I don't think that, like, our, the people who work at nonprofits are naturally risk averse. I think it's, it's quite the opposite, you know. We are all trying to change something, um, and there's riskiness inherent in that. I think it depends for what types of nonprofits um, and the types of the activities that you're providing, um, conducting, and the type of funding that's tied to them. Um, and, you know, um, most of our funding uh, partners uh, aren't looking for risk. You know, they, they're looking for deliverables and outcomes, and they're looking for you to hit all of them, not some of them, <laughs> right? And so, you know, like for me, this, um, I think the systemic nature of um, what we're trying to do is different, because we do have some funders who understand, you know, we could be doing everything in our power as effectively as we can, and um, healthcare.gov can crash, and that's gonna affect things. So there's some things that are outside of our control, but that doesn't mean we still don't need to be firing on all cylinders. I think with direct services, and it really depends on the type of work, I, I think that um, you know we have more education to do with our funders about um, whether they're really investors or whether they are um, consumers. You know, and if they're if they're buying some type of product that makes them feel good in some way, or uh, are they investing uh, in an organization that will hopefully thrive, learn from uh, mistakes, and and uh, and get better? And there's a big distinction there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Aaron. Yeah, I think I mean to the the risk question. I think you know there is a lot more. Um, appetite now for you know sort of entrepreneurial organizations that are you know challenging systems and and that I, I really do think it depends on the organization and what yeah. the issue is um, but I do think you need to celebrate you know sort of the failures as well and talk about them and so we do we do that a lot we actually fund pilots of new things very differently than we fund our traditional work and we segment that based on investors and donors that have the um, the appetite for talking about it and being transparent and discussing you know what really happened and whether it was good or bad and you know in this in the broad sense right so i think there are plenty of people out there but it is definitely sometimes a different base of people than people who are just really you know want that very exact thing that they wanted to inv you know to, to donate to and, and receive a feel-good report on so you just have to segment your donors um i think the question you know on communication and and fundraising i would look at it a little bit differently um First of all, the data shows on fundraising, the biggest thing to do is actually ask. <laughs> so anything you will ever read on fundraising, we just don't actually ask enough. Even at Room to Read, we just recently did, um, we were in Nicholas Kristof's article in the New York Times in his op-ed, and we did um, an email test um, out to a bunch of our donors to tell them to read the article. And one set, we asked people directly, please make a gift to Room to Read. Um, and you know, here's the article, link to the article, and read all about it. On the other one, we said, here, read the article, and, and this is great, you know, let's celebrate this. Three times response rate to the question had a direct ask in it. So you know, it is in person, online, in any way, the biggest failure is we talk about all the great things we're doing, and we never close it with, how much would you like to invest in this incredible impact that we're having? 
however you're comfortable saying it, you have to close it with the ask. And I would say on the communication side, it's really, to me, it's actually not about using a tool. I think the number one thing in our world, because again, of so much of the things we're talking about culture, um, I th would say the, the best way to communicate, particularly if you're talking about change or you're talking about values, is to actually do it in person. I mean, we spend a lot of time setting up opportunities for us to all engage as people. And I think sometimes we rely too much on you know, an email or you know, a, a, an app that can help communicate. If you're really trying to create a culture in an organization, um, there is nothing like showing up in person um, and being able to do that in an, an authentic way as a leadership team. Yeah, you wanted to add one more thing. Yeah, just one other thing I realized is a tool that has <coughs> changed our work because it gets to what Aaron's describing are, um, um, you know, the video conferencing tools. Mm -hmm. That yes. if I would never have to do a phone conference call with 12 people again in my life, I'll be happy, right? Just like being able to see people's expressions and, and body language, that has really helped a lot of work that's uh, done remotely. Hmm. Great. Um, and I want to just put in a quick plug for, um, there's a book out called The Generosity Network. Those of you who know my work, I'm really interested in these kind of networked ways of working. And it's all about the relationship side of fundraising and sort of getting, a, you know, there's just so many dynamics involved in our sector around money, around power and need yeah. and sort of embarrassment to ask and, uh, you know, and it's all about recognizing like we're people engaging in a conversation about change. and. Um, and it's a very relationship-based approach to fundraising. So I found that book to be particularly helpful. So I want to just end on um, kind of two sort of more personal questions for you both as leaders. Um, so I was sitting here realizing this wasn't in the script, so hopefully you'll come up with a good answer on the fly. Um, but I was realizing, you know, part of this conversation implicitly is around diversity. I mean, we've talked about diversity of leadership around generations. We've talked about it around cultures. Um, you know, as an Asian American man, as a woman leading an organization above $40 million. I mean, I hate to say it, our sector is more diverse in many ways. I mean, government's quite diverse, but more diverse than the business sector in many ways. And yet, you know, we still have issues at the very top level of leadership of large organizations around diversity and leadership. And so, you know, sitting here in the heart of Silicon Valley, where there's been this whole, you know, Sheryl Sandberg lean in conversation around women at the top. You know, I'm curious, Erin, what your thoughts are in being a woman leading this global, you know, multi-million dollar organization with, by the way, a very powerful board of a lot of high-tech executives, <laughs> mostly men, right? And, and then same for you, Vincent. I mean, we now have a mayor in San Francisco, Chinese-American mayor, you know, um, but just what you bring to it in terms of your own personal stories around leadership and how that impacts how you think about leadership and, and empowering others in your organizations. You first. <laughs> Me first. Well, Lean in, baby. Yeah, I think the question is, um, you know, is a really important one in terms of gender. I mean, I, you know, we'll start there. It's that's more, you know, sort of my my narrative. And I think that um, we really have not, and I'm very, you know, glad that we're talking about it much more openly. We really have not been honest about the fact that, um, you know, at the end of the day. There is, a, there is something going on in, in the fact that we have not fully embraced female leadership um, at the highest levels. I mean, you cannot be fighting this battle as long as we've all fought this battle to still be in a place where, you know, out of the top, you know, 500 CEOs of Fortune 500 companies or something like 11. 11. You know, so, you, you know, can almost you, count them on two hands. Yeah, almost. Where, you know, every, every, every way you cut the data, um, if you look at, you know, membership on boards, if you look at, you know, leaders in, in chief, uh, chief level suite, um, if you look at you know the women dropping out at what time in their careers, you know in every way that you look at it, it is not a positive story. Um, you look at it globally, and it gets much worse. Um, you know by UN stats, um, you know 67% of the world's work is done by women. 10% of the world's income is earned by women. 10%. 1% of the world's property is owned by women. And of course, property is just a name, a name for political power and economic power. Okay, and this is not an equal playing field in any way, shape, or form. And we're, we have systemic issues that are large and are not going to get better unless, you know, I think we again, you know, need to go back to um, a lot more of, you know, of the beginning days of the women's rights movements where we really talk about these things and we demand, you know, things to be different. 
Um, and that's a very uncomfortable conversation, as we all have. You probably are already starting to get uncomfortable by just talking about it right now in many ways, saying, wow, what does that stat mean? What do we, how do we do that? So we have to, I think, embrace that this is a challenge. And I think a lot about it you know, is sitting down and having those conversations and saying, if this is a really a goal, like you know, many of the things that you're talking about movement creating, you have to think about how does this play out in our policies? How does this play out in, in our, you know, our laws? All of the things that we want to change, we have to go after it in a, in a bigger way. Yeah, well, and, and it's obviously the work you're doing is about empowering girls and women, and education is to some extent the first step to leadership and empowerment, right? Exactly. Without that, With, you can't get to the property, you can't get to <laughs> yeah. the you can't get to the C-suite, you can't yep. be the Sheryl Sandberg or the Hillary Clinton someday, exactly. right? So that's terrific. Yeah. So Vincent, how about um, from your perspective? Well, you know, patriarchy is the problem, right? And you know, men are the ones who are perpetuating it. And I think if we look at it in three different ways. In our organizations, the employment practices, the compensation practices, they disadvantage women. It's just, there's just no way you can, at least to me, mm -hmm. make a, a coherent argument against that, not just in our sector, but in uh, in business world and in government. Um, the, the second way I mean, is at home. Um, the women bear disproportionate responsibilities of caretaking for children. Um, and again, men are the problem because we need to, to step up and do more of that. And then the third part is just in terms of managing what are called social relationships for the family, right? And women are expected to do that as well. And so I think we've got to take on all three of these things, the ones that are probably most directly in our control are within our organizations if we are leading those organizations. But. No, we should be cognizant it's not just right. our sector and, and, and just as to, i was just going to add as an anecdote of the f originally five pioneers in justice the three women all resigned their jobs within two years and so we talk about leaning in or opting out in this book around this whole conversation about the structures of work and even in the nonprofit sector you know it is very hard to be a woman executive director and have young kids or have family obligations or sort of, sort of some of the things that vincent's um talking mm -hmm. about yeah. so i think yeah and I think the way it relates for other aspects of diversity, whether it's race or ethnicity or, or class, uh, faith, um, you know, that um, there, it, it's very similar, right? I think that these are structural questions that we can make a difference on um, in individual ways, but it requires us, like, you know, lean in or opt out. Like, to me, the question is how one leans in. Right. Right. And so if we're leaning in, whatever our background or identity is, in a way that perpetuates the problem, by saying, hey, you know, I made it, what's wrong with everybody else? <laughs> you know, that's not the right way. If we're leaning in in a way that says, you know, we're disrupting the bad practices, that we're reinventing systems to be more fair, that's a different thing. Well, and that goes back to the conversation about culture a little yeah. bit, how you actually embed this in practice, right? And the importance of not just talking about equality, but actually doing it. Yeah, and I think it is inclusive. I mean, I think we, we I was just at a, um, uh, at a women's, you know, conference in New York and one of the things we were talking about is we need to give a name for men who are part of this you know conversation so it's not just like hey we're the cool women trying to do this it's like what is a rat like let's you know we want men to be you know and there's a lot of men who are very interested and helpful and want to have this conversation want to be a part of the solution so I think it's also about creating ways that you know we are all honoring that this is something we, we care about, we want to change, whether it be you know all sorts of different kinds of you know, affirmative action and, and making it part of something that we all own as a solution. It's not a group that has to go do that. Right, yeah. Well, we can start with Vincent and honor exactly. his, like. <laughs> what name do you yeah. want? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's awesome. So, okay, so last question, guys. We, gotta, we have to wrap, we have two minutes. So really quick, any parting advice for folks in the audience who, you know, all of whom are leaders leading on these issues every day, um, you know, in the trenches of your organizations and in your communities. Um, any kind of parting thoughts? I, I would say leadership and, and culture, they're practices. Practice them, you know, keep at it. That they're not things that you check off in a box. You know, they're, they're things you, you keep at, you get better at. Um, sometimes you, you, you mess up. Um, and none of us are perfect. And, and so, you know, I think that um, being able to be vulnerable about that is actually goes a long way. Absolutely, and I think the other thing that has been probably the most helpful for me is um, getting feedback on these issues. I don't think we, you know, we talk enough about these issues, and I think we all have our own ideas. But you know, just as you're saying, we have to sit and we have to discuss. You know, what are we all as a group doing? And I think culture. When you talk about things like culture, culture is not made by one person, right? Culture is made by a group of people. So, what does everybody think about our culture and how are we doing this culture? Leadership. The most important thing on leadership is to get honest. You know 
feedback on how you're doing. And so, you know, in every performance review I have, I also say, you know, how can I help support you better as a leader? And we have 360 feedback where they're incredibly painful processes if you've never gone through one, but they're the most enlightening thing you could ever do, where you're asking a whole group of people to give feedback. And, and we have regularly, you know, sort of different people in our organization at top leadership go through those processes. Um, and that's a really healthy thing to do because they hear things that they would never have expected and that actually are the hardest things you know, to, to hear, but then once you do, you can often find solutions to being able to, to unlock, you know, that feedback. And so it's part of our performance management is to get that feedback from, you know, your peers, from your direct reports, from your supervisors, so that there is this sort of 360 feeling of like, let's get it from all different people we're interacting with. And I think that's incredibly important um, as you grow leaders so that they can really see what their blind spot is and start to, you know, to work towards resolving it. Yeah, and I think I guess my parting words of advice would be, um, I think one thing I've realized in doing more and more leadership work in the sector is just the importance of creating the space and the time to have these conversations. I know every time I sit down with folks like you two, I learn a ton about leadership. I mean, it's very humbling, but there's just so much um, richness in just even having these conversations. So I would encourage you all to find your own peer groups as well, whether it's with people in this room or people in your organization where you can sit down and talk about it. As mm -hmm. Vincent said, you know, we talk about it. Make it explicit, have these conversations, take it back to your organization. So with that, I wanna just thank Vincent and Aaron for being amazing panelists and thank sharing you. their wisdom with us. Thank you. And Mara, if you wanna come up and uh, close us out, there you are.